from Peterson's version of the message. Um, I've been using this for quite a while and sometimes it just gives a little bit of a different twist on what the traditional versions we have, at least what I grew up with. I can't say speak for all of you. Um, but the first is from 1 John 4, 7 through 14. And I can't read this without that song popping in my brain about beloved, let us love one another. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know God if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sin and the damage that sin has done to our relationship with God. My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God, not ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us, perfect love. And this is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in him and he in us. He's given us life from his life, from his very own spirit, and we've seen for ourselves and continue to state openly that God sent his son as savior of the world. And then from the 15th chapter of John's gospel, the first eight verses, Jesus is speaking. I am the real vine and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes and every branch that is grape bearing, he prunes back so it will come to bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. Live in me, make your home in me just as I do in you. For in the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you are joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you produce grapes and when you mature as my disciples. When Eric first emailed me and invited me to come um, and, and be with you, I thought, wow, that's really kind of an interesting thing because it has been a number of years and a lot has happened in those years. Um, and I was wondering how many faces I would remember <laughs> and names, <laughs> so it's great. And when I looked at the passages, because I'm still a lectionary preacher, because <laughs> that's how I was trained all those years ago, and I looked at the readings for today, all I could think of was love because that's the focus the most important teaching of the Christian faith, the commandment to love, to love God totally with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We hear that all the time. In order to be a genuine Christian, we must love God in that way. It's important to acknowledge that every single day especially in these days, in this time of crisis due to COVID and polarization 
at least in this country, due to the politics. Not just our country is affected, though. The entire world feels like it's in upheaval. We've never had to live through anything like this before. So love becomes even more critical. How we love God and how we live out that love by loving one another. First John tells us that this love we have comes from God. And we learn about the nature of love because of our experience of God first loving us. This love is a gift. We don't earn it. It's not something we achieve. God gives it. John says that those who are unable to love their sisters and brothers are unable to love God because it's God love that teaches us how to embrace and love one another and enables us to do that. And we're also reminded that when we love someone, it doesn't necessarily mean we even like them or that we admire what they do, but we love them because they are God's children. We serve because God first loved us, and that's the way Jesus lived his life. Sometimes we're asked to love people in really difficult circumstances. To love someone with whom we have nothing in common. We're even told to love our enemies. And we only have to listen to the news or pick up a newspaper for anybody who still does that these days, I do. Look on our Facebook feed, our Instagram page, see what's coming out on Twitter. All this stuff didn't exist much 16 years ago. And yet every time we just see these messages that are the antithesis of the understanding of God's command to love. The assumptions our culture promotes about love aren't necessarily biblical. A lot of the culture talks about love as a feeling, but it's not. It's not just a feel-good thing. Jesus didn't always have warm, fuzzy feelings toward others. Sometimes he felt weary or frustrated or overwhelmed. Sometimes he felt irritated or angry. And at times he simply had to go away. He had to kind of leave, be on his own, perhaps to allow him to work through some of those feelings, to make sure he didn't do or say anything that would harm others. We know that we can love someone and still not have real positive feelings towards some of the things they do or say. Love influences our feelings, but love is not the same thing as a feeling. Feelings come and go. They're very volatile at times, and they're also transient. Love is steadfast. We hear that word. It's not a common word in today's culture, but that's what the Bible talks about. Love is steadfast. Feelings often are not, as we know. They can change just from one moment to the next, depending on what's happening in that given moment. So there are two essential components to love I want to lift up today. Love is about motive and effort. And we see this in the way Jesus lived his life. He never really talks much about how he feels or his feelings toward others. But he was very transparent in his motives in how he treated others. His motives were always rooted in the well-being and wish for growth for those whom he encountered. So the first element to love is motive, and the second one is effort. Jesus constantly made the effort to help people become more whole, to help them grow in their understanding of how to be in the world as a disciple. Love doesn't operate out of a sense of selfishness, but it's generated by the realities of who that other person is and how we can help them 
grow and flourish in their love. In his book, The Road Less Traveled, M. Scott Peck describes a young man who was talking to a counselor saying, my mother loved me so much, she wouldn't let me ride the bus to school even when I was in high school. I had to beg her so that I could ride the bus like the other kids. Was that really love on the part of the mother? He thought so, and then working with the counselor, he came to understand it was really her need to control him. That's not love. It might sort of look like that on the surface, but that really wasn't what was driving that mother. It was her own insecurities wanting to keep him under her thumb. What appears to be love might sometimes be the opposite. It might actually be selfishness, unconcerned for the well-being for the other, but using the other to meet our own needs. That's not really love. And then the second element of effort. I'm sure you've heard this phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Sound familiar? Right. It's motive minus the effort. Well, we have the right idea, but we never do anything about it. And so when we look at love and we think about what are the efforts that we need to make to live out this love, I'm going to talk about five different things. Listening, presence, flexibility, detachment, commitment, and sacrifice. That's actually six. I can't count. Six things. These really help us to understand what love is. Often, when I think about my own life, when I have failed to love someone as they need to be loved, it's usually because I'm not doing one of those necessary things. So we're just going to briefly look at them. The first one is listening. We can't love someone without listening to them. Again, another illustration from Peck's book where he talks about a parent listening to her six-year-old child. And he said there's kind of five levels of this. One is to not really even listen and just tell the child to just be quiet or more negatively, just shut up. Sometimes we do that when we are not in a place where we can listen. A second level is to let the child talk, but just kind of ignore it and not really pay attention. The third level is, well, we're pretending to listen, but our minds are really engaged elsewhere and, and we're not really paying very good attention. A fourth level is pay attention, but kind of selectively. Well, oh, this was important, oh, but I don't really need to pay attention to what this is. So we make the choice as to what's important for that child instead of really listening to what the child thinks is important. The fifth level is really focusing and concentrating on what that child is saying, really paying attention for as long as the child needs us to pay attention. It's not easy. And we have to suspend our sense of judgment, but it takes energy to do that, but that's when we really are engaging. When we are listening with more than just our ears, we are really engaging our whole selves in hearing what that child has to say. Doesn't happen very often, does it? When we really feel someone is listening to us with their whole being. And yet that's what genuine love is about. Love also involves being present. Again, that physical presence, but also emotionally present and, and paying attention. Sometimes it's sharing experiences and you don't even have to have a lot of conversation. Sometimes it's working side by side to do something good in the world. It might be spending time playing together, board games or whatever. For me, it's going out on long walks and on the way home picking up trash. That has become one of my spiritual practices during this time of COVID. <laughs> when everything was shut down, 
I couldn't go out to all the music I'm used to going out to. So I started, I mean, I always took walks, but I started with intentionality, really walking, and, and then picking up trash. It's one of the things I can do. Another part of this love is being flexible. Sometimes we need to embrace and sometimes we need to let go instead of clinging and hanging on so tightly. There can be a time to be soft with someone and also a time to be pretty firm and tough. We've heard that term, tough love. Calling for accountability in a way that still respects and loves the other person. Sometimes we need to lend a hand or maybe even some dollars to someone who has a need. It's also that saying, sometimes we need to give, give a person a fish, but sometimes we need to teach them how to fish. We don't want to make them dependent. We want to help them become independent, but interrelated and interdependent. They're not exactly the same thing. Our motives determine our actions. And so we ask ourselves, what action is really going to help our beloved person, whether it's a child or a parent or a sibling or a friend or a neighbor or a spouse? What is really going to help them thrive and flourish and grow in their own ability to love? A fourth one may seem a little odd, detachment. But that really means we honor that this is really a separate, independent person. Because sometimes we try to make our loved ones extensions of who we are, and we try to force them into our little way of looking at the world. But that's not true love. We can help to teach, we can model, we can mentor, but we also sometimes have to stand back and let them experiment and try things, even if it means they fail at something, because that's how we learn and grow. Some people are so self-centered, they really have a hard time doing that. They don't see other people as distinct or unique from who they are. But mature love is knowing that each individual is one of God's children, and God created each one of us uniquely. Even identical twins have some uniqueness to them. We all have a little bit of mystery within us. Sometimes we do things that surprise other people. But we work to be in tune with that love of God in order to bring that love to others. A fifth effort is commitment. The word commitment comes from a Latin word that literally means to put it out there. We resolve to share with another person and be with them, not knowing what the future holds. Nobody could have predicted a pandemic. Well, actually, there were some people saying it was possible. But what it has done to us has just upended our, just about everything we know about how we live our lives. And yet, we stick together, and we support one another whether it's through someone being ill and praying and hoping and working for their recovery. We've lost people that we love, and we haven't been able to even have our normal funerals. And yet we find a way to be with one another, to support one another, and to love one another because we are committed to doing that. It's hard to do that sometimes, to stick with someone in the midst of all that's happening. And so it may involve even a little bit of the sixth effort, self-sacrifice, perhaps the most difficult of all. When we love someone, sometimes that means we need to make changes in our lives because they see something in us and point it out or they see something in us and we want to become better. And so we may have to change some things we do 
But Jesus said we cannot enter into a deeply loving relationship with God without losing our own selves in that love to God. Anyone who truly loves takes that risk of having to change. We can't love a spouse while hanging on to every single thing that we think is right. Well, you have to do it this way. What's the old argument about the toilet paper and whether it's over or under? <laughs> you know, or, or how you put the dishes in the cupboard or what, you know, we get so, at least I do. I, I'm a very organized person and I like things done just so. And then if I'm with someone and they, they didn't put this back where I think it should be, like really, does that matter? <laughs> you know, so what are the critical things that are important? And how can I be open to changing in ways for my growth and my ability to love better? I can't just hang on to the way I always used to do it. When we become parents, if we become parents, not everybody does, but many of us do, having that new life come into our world changes everything. And if we weren't willing to change, then we wouldn't be good parents. That little person who comes into our lives really makes a big difference. So love is both motive and effort. It's wanting the well-being and growth of those we love and even of those we don't love very well. It requires that listening and presence and flexibility, commitment, sacrifice, detachment, all of those things the effort we put into our relationships bears fruit. That's what the Bible tells us. When we can love, we can make a huge difference. And when we love God, we have the power to transform the world. When we work together as a community, you're doing some wonderful things as a community, the beloved church that you are, helping to feed people providing educational experiences, providing fellowship opportunities. All of this is because of your devotion, dedication, and love of God. God comes alive when we are able to love as Jesus taught us. When we put in that effort to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. When we listen and allow ourselves to be open to new ways of doing things. When we get flexible rather than getting stuck in kind of the self-righteous, well, I know better than you do. When we open ourselves, God will be with us. We are part of the body of Christ. We have to be willing to give up a little of who we are to be in relation with one another and part of this community. And yet that allows our faith to be deepened, reshaped, transformed, we become more spiritually awakened as we strive to be more and more like Jesus. A single act of love can be so contagious. When we are willing to love and to risk, we can grow that love one by one. The ripples, just like the ripples of the pond, again, another familiar image go out and sometimes touch lives that we won't even ever know about. But we do trust that God is in the midst of it. And when we choose to love and then that person chooses to love and then that person chooses to love, then pretty soon the world overflows with love. So let us focus on that. And if you remember this little song, sing along. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of god and everyone that loveth is born of god and knoweth god those that loveth not knoweth not god for god is love beloved let us love one another first john 4 7 and 8. I remember that, it's either Bible school or church camp, I can't remember, but that song just, every time I read that passage, beloved, let us love one another, amen.